after giving water the love that it so, so deserved, and creating the epic battle that was State 2 versus the rest of the world, how on earth do you possibly top yourself? By changing up the entire game. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are about to hit a convergence in which the Naruto that you once knew is going to start becoming a lot more like the Naruto you currently know. Set 9 was very aptly named The Chosen, and the reason for this will become apparent in just a moment. Unfortunately, if you're here to listen to Kudo talk about the pretty cards, you're gonna have to wait a little bit. Set 9 introduced a ton of new shakeups to the way that the game worked, so we have to go over those first in order to give us context for what I'm about to talk about. The first major shakeup to the game was the increase in deck size. Yes, set 9 was the first set in which our deck limit went from being 40 to 50. To compensate for this change, the ninja limit also went from 25 to 30. This gave meta players a lot of things to think about, because having access to 5 new ninja cards and 5 new non-ninja cards meant that you had to be creative in how exactly you wanted to acclimate to the new meta. There were two extremely common ways to adapt. The first, and the most common, was to now use 10 turn zeros and then two more copies of a boss monster. This meant that the new turn zero lineup would be three of one ninja, three of another ninja, and then two of one ninja and two of another ninja, giving you 10 ninja altogether. This would then give you space for exactly two more copies of a boss monster like your Zabuzas, your Itachis, etc, etc. If you were using a deck that was extremely staple heavy or a little bit more early game focused, then you could instead use 8 turn zeros, that being a 3-3-2 three, three, lineup. Then this would give you 4 more spots to either put in more staples or stabilize your mid game. While this was a little bit common, mental decks took full advantage, as well as Gata over 9000 decks, because most of the time, Gata didn't really need any boss monsters, considering how powerful Gata himself was. With your five new non-ninja cards, there weren't quite as many rules, but everybody gravitated towards one of two new set styles. You could either do an even 10 missions and 10 jutsu to make sure that you're keeping an even mix of both, or you could do 12 missions and 8 jutsus, since normally your missions are how you would pay for your jutsus in the first place. You could technically balance it in Jutsu's favor, especially when you're running something like Gata over 9000, but it was a lot less common because if you weren't consistently playing a mission every turn, then by the time Gata actually hit the field, you normally weren't going to have enough chakra to do the crazy Jutsu stuff in the first place. You could still get away with it by introducing a lot of cards that charged up your chakra area, but that's metagaming discussion for another day. The next huge change is the block format. If you happen to not know what block format is, it's also called set rotation. In layman's terms, old sets out, new sets in. The way Naruto chose to do this is the current set was of course legal, and also the four sets that preceded it, meaning that blocks of five sets were legal at a time. Interesting, interesting. Let's see where that leaves us. This is the current set, then one... Two, three, four. Uh-oh. It seems that by <coughs> pure coincidence, this just so happens to lock off Revenge and Rebirth. Dang. Man, I'm just, I'm so busted up over here. I'm sure the player base just hated not being able to play with Revenge and Rebirth anymore. In all seriousness, though, some people did hate that they couldn't play with Revenge and Rebirth anymore. To be fair, this also did cut out a lot of very, very famous staples for the time, like Cop Naruto, my personal favorite card in the game, as well as some of the great cards that came in the sets before, like Giant Water Vortex from set 1. And look, I get it. There's a lot of emotion that comes swirling around when we talk about limited and unlimited sets in card games, and there are great points to be made on both sides. You've got one side of people that argue that, yes, it is a little bit awful that in order to be a competitive player, you have to continuously buy into an entirely new deck of cards after a certain amount of time has passed. And then you've got another side that says, if we don't start rotating these sets out, then either we're going to have to power creep the older sets by introducing a lot of very unhealthy things to the game, 
or we're going to hit a point of stagnation where we're seeing the same types of decks over and over and over again year by year. I'm going to be fully transparent here. I fall into group two. I understand if you've spent a bunch of money getting a competitive deck together and then the company comes around and tells you that that deck now has a set shelf life, but I do think people are a little bit dramatic when it comes to this idea. In my own personal opinion, I think card games should be a lot more creative than they actually are. Usually what happens is once the best things come out, it's just a matter of who can spend the most money to get the best available cards. And I do think this idea of competitive players just buying up all of the absolute best stuff for exorbitant prices and then sort of pushing everybody else out of tournaments is a, a, something that should be punished to a small degree. The natural order of the card game ecosystem goes like this. Sellers buy up the booster packs. They then take the best cards from those booster packs and they sell them to competitive players. Once the competitive players don't have needs for the best cards anymore, then they sell those cards off to casual players and collectors. Because of this cycle, the sellers will always have money from the competitive players to keep buying more booster packs. And the competitive players are getting money from the casual players and the collectors to continue buying the best cards that the sellers get out of their booster packs. This also means that the best and rarest cards will pass through at least a few people and then eventually land in a place with somebody who can really appreciate them. Not to say that competitive players can't appreciate a rare or cool looking card, but I don't think that they can appreciate it on the same level that a true collector who really wants to collect every card in a set or a casual player who really won't get the chance to experience high level play like the competitive players will. I also think that it leads into this idea that every year when you tune into a world championship or a regional, it's interesting to see what new developments have hit a game, as opposed to just seeing the same deck that you saw last year with two or three cards replaced. Again, if you're somebody who's very much against block formats, I'm not telling you you're wrong, but I am explaining to you why I am on the side that I am. And I'm letting you know that I do think block format introduction was very healthy for the game. I also want to point out that not every tournament's locale actually adopted block format immediately. Bondi would actually leave the choice up to each venue whether they wanted to switch over to the new block format or continue running unlimited. While the venues that I played at personally all switched over to block format, I do know that there are a lot of people who didn't. So if you happen to be thinking to yourself, hey, wait a minute, I don't remember there being a block format back during set 9 when I played, that's probably because your shop chose not to incorporate block format. This choice wouldn't last forever though, in a few sets, block format would become mandatory whether we wanted it to or not. The final huge change that came with set 9 was the introduction of the rogue list. If you're thrown off by the name Rogue List, don't be. It's just a fancy way of saying Ban List, but of course, because we're in the Naruto universe, we gotta keep it topical. The Rogue List worked just like any other Ban List out there. You had limited cards that you could only have one copy of, semi-limited cards that you could have two copies of, and just outright banned cards that you could have zero copies of. This would also come with some pretty major erratas, for example, the Bro Kage from set 4, if tournaments were still allowing him in, actually had his effect changed so that you would have to discard him immediately if you used his effect rather than him sticking around to the end of the turn. Now, uh, <laughs> with the introduction of the rogue list, um, there is something pretty big that we have to talk about. Now, I take a lot of pride when I make these videos that I do as much research as humanly possible to make sure that they are as accurate as possible. I make a mistake every now and then, but unfortunately, that's just the nature of covering old card games. Information that was available 10, 11, 12 years ago isn't necessarily as available today. And unfortunately, that's, uh, that's the case here with the Naruto CCG. There are two major problems when it comes to talking about classic Naruto. One is that you can no longer find reliable lists that tell you what the rogue list would look like during the time that you're talking about a specific set. 
So unfortunately, that means that if a card was banned or limited, unless I know it from memory, I can't really talk about it that much, which is going to limit the way that I talk about how decks were built. In a lot of cases, that means I'm probably going to have to talk about the way a deck would have been built if it weren't banned or limited, but you do need to know that going forward. If I do happen to mention a specific card and I talk about including two or three copies of it, and it happened to be limited or banned at the time, I simply don't have the information to have known that before I included it in the video. As much as I want these videos to be historically accurate, I knew from the beginning that I would never be able to make them 100% accurate, so this is something that I've already accepted. Some of the information that I give you is going to be a teeny tiny bit incorrect, but this is mainly about celebrating the old card games that I used to enjoy, and really seeing what limits could be pushed within them to overcome the meta. The second problem that arises is that in order to keep old cards in the actual metagame itself, Bondi would actually re-release certain cards as promos. These promos could be won at tournament venues, or uh, they could be actually given out during certain events, and they would essentially be reprints of old cards. The reason that I bring this up is I have memories of around sets 9, 10, and 11, there being a reprint of the Chidori and Brokage. Unfortunately, however, when I actually went to do research on when these promos were given out and how you could get them, I could not find valid information. This could mean one of a couple of things. Either my timeline is wrong, and the Chidori and Brokage reprints would actually happen much later into the game, or these didn't happen at all, and I am just sort of making it all up in my head. However, I do see that there are promo versions of these cards available, but I don't know if those came out during set 9 or before set 9. And if they came out before set 9, I don't know how much longer those promos would allow them to be playable. The entire thing is a gigantic mess. I absolutely hate the way that Bondi did their promo system. In fact, let's go ahead and talk about that next. In most card games, when a promo is available, it is either as a part of a set, or there is some kind of indication within the card itself that tells you exactly when or why that card came out, making it very easy to verify what sets it was a part of online. Not so much the case with the Naruto CCG. You see, in Naruto, Bandai decided to take every single promo that was ever released and put it into its own category called promos. These promos are numbered based on their release, which makes it impossible to verify when during a set a specific promo came out. There are no dates on promo cards that tell you what year they came out so you can narrow it down. They don't have a set icon that tells you what set they were released alongside. And their number is absolutely useless, because it will tell you what cards came out before or after it, but still not give you a direct time frame for when that card was released and available to the public. And on top of all of this, there were regional promos. Yes, cards that came out specifically in the United States or in other parts of the world. So sometimes, in the US region, we would actually get a reprint of a card that allowed it into our metagame, but because that card wasn't reprinted in other regions, they would not have access to it in their metagame. All of this is a gigantic cluster of nonsense, and this hurts me a lot, but I will have to, for the most part, ignore promo cards unless I specifically remember when they came out and why they were used. This is going to make a couple of people a teeny tiny bit upset, and understandably so, because promos were actually a part of the metagame in a lot of very, very popular decks. See, the problem is I can't even verify this by looking at old Naruto decks because now Trade Cards Online isn't up anymore. I mean, maybe if I actually got these videos out in a timely manner and not put seven months in between releases, that wouldn't be such a problem, but unfortunately this is the world we live in. So I really only have one fix here that could potentially appease everybody, and that is that I will also be releasing small addendum videos during the series 
that should correct any small mistakes in previous videos. That means if I happen to get contacted by people who are in the community and have some kind of verifiable source that tells me, for example, what the ban lists looked like at the time, or when certain promos came out, then I can make a tiny addendum video that just goes back over the information that I gave during that set video and just correct the information that I gave. It's not a perfect solution, but hopefully you guys will work with me a little bit here and accept that as the best solution that I have right now. Getting back into the actual game, though, this set actually put the meta in an amazing spot. We were back to having a fairly healthy metagame where no matter which of the five elements you chose to play, you had some kind of competitive deck that was unlocked for you. At the top of the heap, you had Wind and Water, Wind obviously rocking the Gara 9000, and Water rocking the State 2. Right below them, you had Fire and Earth. Fire had access to the Uchiha, which are just always going to be a popular and powerful staple deck and Earth that has access to mental power decks and lots and lots of control. At the bottom of this little ladder you had Rasengan Naruto decks representing Lightning. I want you to understand though, it's not totally fair to say that it was the bottom of the ladder. While it is true that Lightning was still technically the weakest of all five of the elements, Lightning stood a much better chance of beating the other four decks than it has in literally any other set thus far. Rasengan and Toads ended up merging into one archetype that created a very, very explosive late game buildup for the deck itself. The Lightning metagame was turn half of your deck into Chakra and then spam a bunch of Jutsus. When you're out of Jutsus to play, you drop Gamma Bunta and you swing for game. Again, not totally as powerful as the other four elements, but it was still powerful enough that you could win consistently. And that's the mark of a real metagame, when you can play a variety of things that win consistently, even if there are specific things within the metagame that are technically more powerful. The bigger deck sizes also meant that there was a lot more variation within decks that were at the top of the metagame. If you're a true OG Kurokun fan, you probably remember me mentioning in an earlier video something called a packet. Packets are essentially small sets of cards that no matter what deck you were running, you could include within it to give you access to a tool that one of the other elements had. If you need an example of a packet, here's for example what a water Kitomaru packet would look like. You had two copies of Kitomaru himself along with his Jutsu Fierce Rip. For staples, you had a couple of copies of Haku, who was a really, really good card for just about any deck at the time, along with two copies of a decent enough mission card in Split Personality. One copy of Emmy, because as far as clients go, she's still one of the most powerful at this point in the game. And then two copies of another boss monster. Either Zabuza or Kisame are going to be the most popular here. While these cards aren't necessarily set in stone, this was a decent example of how you want to structure a packet that you put into another deck. Putting something like this in your deck would give you access to Kitamaru, even if your deck had nothing to do with Kitamaru. As you can probably imagine, the biggest advantage to increasing the deck size was that multicolored decks were much, much more powerful. For example, just because you're running a Gara over 9000 deck doesn't mean you have to run the same Gara over 9000 deck that everybody else is running. You could, for example, dual color into Lightning, which would give you access to much better Jutsu spam, a very, very popular decision for most people who played Gara at the time. You could run Wind Earth, which gave you access to really powerful mental decks, as well as some tools that would let you counter things happening in the meta. Wind Water, which would actually increase the power of your late game, borrowing the boss monsters from water so that you yourself could run them once your Jutsu spam ran out. Finally, you could run Wind Fire, which gave you almost nothing, uh, essentially just access to one extremely good mission card and Sasuke and Kakashi, so if you happen to be big fans of them, then that was an option as well. Alrighty, I think that's about enough of me talking about the new shakeups of the game and the new way that the Naruto card game would look going forward. Let's talk about the actual cards. I never really nailed down an exact way that I want to do this, so what I've decided to do here is we'll go over each of the elements in order of importance. 
and we'll just talk about the cards that were shaking up specific deck styles within each of those elements. Let's go ahead and start with the most exciting part of the metagame thus far, Gata over 9000. Gata himself was already in such a great spot, but they decided to give him a ton of new options to open up how the deck would function. Let's go ahead and start by looking at arguably one of Gata's absolute best jutsu, Double Sandblade. Double Sandblade lets you target one ninja, flip a blade coin, and if it's heads, give it one damage, if it's tails, give it two damage. It sounds simple, but the fact that it lets you target one ninja means that if you happen to go out and attack with Gata and your opponent either chooses a chump blocker to block with, or just no ninja to block with, it meant that you could still target their absolute beefiest ninja all the same. It was kind of like a slightly nerfed spider bow fierce rip, but I mean, what are you gonna do? You can't just give Gata straight up fierce rip. Sand Levitation gave your deck some form of protection. It's one chakra, and it makes it so no ninja in your team can be targeted by a jutsu. Admittedly, targeted removal wasn't necessarily a huge part of the game at this point, but it did protect everybody in your team from a spider bow fierce rip. Not a hugely phenomenal card when you consider all of the other forms of removal that Gata has, but it was something you could side deck if you really needed it. Awakening of the Monster was just a completely different direction you could take your Gata deck in, because it lets you actually play Shukaku in a fairly competitive way. Probably the biggest thing about this card is it doesn't need the turn 4 Gata, it can actually activate off of a turn 2 Gata. So, you can have Shukaku as early as turn 2, and all of a sudden you have just this giant beefy 9 power attacker that your opponent can't do anything about. As far as non gata Jutsu cards go, there was actually a pretty huge push during this time to gaining Chakra, so that you could successfully run all of these new Jutsus you were being given without having to tech in Lightning. Preparation for Victory was a great example of this, because it lets you essentially turn one Chakra into three Chakra, by first moving this to the Chakra area, and then moving two more cards from your discard pile to the Chakra area. Subjective was just a straight up spider bow fierce rip counter. You choose one jutsu card with target one ninja written on it, and you can choose a new target for that card. So if your opponent did drop a spider bow fierce rip, or if you're playing the mirror match and your opponent drops a double sand blade, you can actually turn the target of that jutsu into one of your opponent's ninja, so that they're essentially killing themselves. You can even do some hilarious stuff with this, like actually target the Kitamaru or Gata who's using the Jutsu and have them kill themselves with their own Jutsu, because once they've declared that that Jutsu's being used, they can't just choose to fizzle it themselves. That Jutsu's gonna go off, and it's gonna go off on the target that you now choose. Another form of protection that Wind was given was Yukie Fujikaze. Um, this is a card that you can run if you don't have another client. There are slightly better clients out there, but when this card comes into play, anytime your opponent uses a jutsu with two specific symbols, which means it's good against both Fierce Rip and also the Mirror Match, you can flip a coin and if it's heads, you just automatically negate that jutsu and send it to the chakra area, and then Yukie goes to your chakra area. So not only is it Jutsu Negation for free, but it also turns itself into a Chakra once it's done its job. This meant that you could even hypothetically run multiple Yukies and actually activate them all in the same game. This was unique compared to other clients that stayed in play the entire game, like Emmy. And obviously, you only have a 50% chance of its effect actually going off, so it's not something you can rely on heavily. But again, it's completely free, and it turns itself into Chakra once it's done its job. This made it a little bit too good to actually ignore. Another counter you had to Kitamaru and Fierce Rip is Legendary Sitting Duck. Every time your opponent flips a Ninja Blade coin, it turns into Tails, regardless of what the result would have normally been. To give your God Eye deck just a little bit more power, they released this card called Light and Darkness, which basically lets you take your God Eye of the Desert and put two growth coins on it, each of them representing plus one plus one, so your gatas were now seven fours, which made them fairly beefy. You could also use this with Naruto, but 
It just wasn't as common to use it with Naruto as it was for Gata. It still exists, but it's way more common to see it in this deck. While the classic Gata over 9000 deck is great, it actually came out in a new flavor during this set. Starter decks came out with a card called Sand Coffin Gata, and this was such a good card to be coming out in a starter deck that it's unbelievable. During your mission phase, you can discard two of your chakras and then select one of your opponent's ninjas that cannot go out to block that turn. So it's like Emmy, but a hundred times better because you could actually choose female ninja with it and you could do it without taking up your client slot. Up until now, the entire thing behind Gata decks and why they work so well is that you have a Gata that can get you a Jutsu every single time it goes out to battle. So what you could do instead of doing that was run this Gata along with an element like Lightning that would let you put a bunch of cards into your Chakra area and all of a sudden you could just sort of cheese your opponent out in the late game instead of relying just on your Jutsu. That wasn't to say that you were really trading off your jutsu, you were mostly trading off deck consistency. There were going to be plenty of times where you're running this gata in a deck and you still have a handful of jutsu that you can cast very, very easily. But you don't have the consistency of, if you don't have a handful of jutsu, getting those jutsu into your hand before a battle begins. Overall though, this was a really, really good strategy, and because it came in a starter deck, it made Gata over 9,000 decks accessible to just about everybody. And that's not even all. Separation was a permanence mission card that basically let you separate one of your opponent's best ninjas out of their team, and that ninja cannot be included in a team with any other ninja while this card is in play. You play this, you separate out their best ninja so that it's by itself. Then you use Gata's effect to declare that the other two ninja in that team cannot go out to block. So your opponent either has to block with their one best ninja, which they're probably not going to do, or they have to take the battle rewards. Of course, there's a chance your opponent has other ninja in play, but no matter what, this puts your opponent in a very, very bad situation that you're going to come out ahead in. Blush did roughly the same thing. If your opponent has any female ninja in play, then they cannot go out to attack in the same team as those male ninja. So your opponent has to rearrange their teams, and they have to put their female ninjas in one separate pile and their male ninjas in another separate pile, and then of course you can control them further with Goddess Effect. Finally, you also had the option of teching in Earth and using the final tournament started, which made it so that only Genin ninjas can be sent out to battle this turn. My eagle-eyed viewers may have already noticed this, but Gata himself is a Genin ninja despite how powerful he is. That meant that you could actually build around this and use something like the Ino Shika Cho to make sure that you had really, really good teams of Genin ninja that you could still send out to battle while your opponent would have to play around something they probably weren't quite ready for. All of this support cemented Cheese Gata as a very, very viable way of playing the Gata over 9000 strategy. You still had access to all of the great jutsu that Gata himself could use, but you also had access to this sort of cheesy way to victory if you needed it. Speaking of Gata over 9000, I myself coined a version of Gata over 9000 around the forums at this time. You see, I used a Wind Lightning deck, and this is the Gata that I chose to use. His effect essentially gives you one Chakra every single turn, and you could pair him up with this Sakura that let you switch two of the cards in your discard pile with two of the cards in your Chakra area every single turn. You may have a lot of questions, but bear with me for a second. You then pair all of this up with Jiraiya, whose effect lets you get a Jutsu out of the discard pile every turn and put it in your hand. So here's the way it worked. You used a really good Jutsu card with Gata. During your next turn, you use Sakura to put that Jutsu plus one other card into your discard pile while taking the two cards that you used to pay for that Jutsu and putting them back into the Chakra area. You then used Jiraiya's effect to put the Jutsu you just used back into your hands and you used Gata's effect to put the other card that you switched out of your chakra area back into the chakra area. This gave you consistent access to all of your jutsu at all times, and allowed you to cycle out your cards and give you more chakra to work with. 
To put it into perspective, if you keep this Gata on the field for four turns, that's four extra chakra that you're playing off of that you didn't have access to before. That's two more sand blades. Or heck, one more sand tsunami. Regardless of how you used the chakra, it was a way of getting a lot more chakra than you were normally going to have if you used either of the other two Gata's. I won't say that this went on to become a very popular Gata over 9000 strategy, but I am still proud of coming up with the idea and having it gain at least a little bit of traction within my small community. To wrap this up, let's go ahead and talk about a couple more cards. We had another really great card come out of the starter decks, that being Sakura Toughness, whose effect was when they battle an injured status, you could flip two coins, and if you got at least one heads, then you negated the damage. This basically let you stall for a really, really long time if you had a deck that didn't have a great mid-game. Finally, you had Kudenai, whose effect was basically you could discard two chakras when she comes into play to get a growth coin. This card, once again, came out of a starter deck, and it was a card that could consistently have four support, making it awesome. On the other side of wind, medical Kunoichi decks were actually starting to take a lot better form in this set, Starting with, god dang it, another starter deck card, Tsunade. Tsunade was just a really, really good boss monster for Kunoichi medical decks to have, because you could discard one of your chakra every turn to heal one of your injured ninjas, making it a lot easier to stall out or deal with cards like Kitomaru. Kitomaru deals one damage, you heal one damage, easy peasy. This non-starter deck Tsunade had roughly the same effect, but its effect happened whenever this ninja was sent out to attack instead of at the beginning of your turn. We could argue back and forth which one is technically better, but I do prefer this Tsunade over the starter deck. Specifically because you can play a mission during your mission phase to make sure that you have enough chakra for her effect. This Sakura also existed. Basically, if you paired her up with another medical ninja, then she also gave you the effect that you could discard a chakra at the end of your turn to heal one of your ninjas. And finally, we have one more Tsunade. Oh, uh, excuse me. We have a fifth Hokage, who turns every victory she wins into an outstanding victory, but she comes with the downside that you have to flip a coin, and if it's tails, it costs you one chakra to attack with her team. I guess that's kind of a downside, but I really don't see it as too big of a problem. Honestly, her turning every victory into an outstanding victory meant that your opponent had to play a lot more carefully. Because if you have to play a deck that was built specifically around this strategy, where you used a lot of pump jutsu to turn yourself into higher numbers, then your opponent was in a lot of trouble because it put a clock on how many turns they could stall out in front of you. Shizune was also a thing. If she's a back ninja, which of course she's going to be because why would you ever put her in the front? During the showdown, you can discard one of your wind chakra if you happen to lose to mitigate the damage your head ninja takes by one. Again, this was mainly a stall tactic. You were usually doing this in order to build time for you to get out your wind condition. But this was a very easily techable card, so you could also use it in your Gata decks if you so wished. Finally, we have Kunoichi versus Kunoichi. Basically, if you had teams of all-female ninja, then your opponent's male ninja effects were negated as long as they were battling your female ninja. In addition to this, your female ninja's effects cannot be negated, so things like Shikamaru don't even get a chance to take place. Moving right on over to water, uh... I'll be honest with you guys, Water didn't get a whole lot out of this set. It basically just got more boss monsters, which was definitely not what we needed at the time, but whatever. You know, you can't really get the sound 4 that we got in the last set and then continue to complain that we didn't get even better stuff during this set. It's like getting a PS5 for Christmas and then complaining that you only got a $50 extravagant meal during Valentine's Day. You just don't do that. So let's go ahead and start by looking at Orochimaru. It's actually been a little while since an Orochimaru has been as relevant as this one, because this one can use any water jutsu regardless of its requirements, as long as it costs three or less chakra. This meant that if something happened to your Kitomaru, you had yet another ninja in play that could actually use Spider Bow Fierce Rip instead. Or if you're just a crazy person and for whatever reason don't want to use Kitomaru, this gives you the chance to use Fierce Rip without actually having to put Kitomaru in your deck. Why would you do that? I don't know. It's a weird world out there. 
Some people eat Parmesan cheese. I don't question it. I know it's gross. I don't know why they do what they do. This also meant, hilariously, that Tuyuya was once again invalidated, because you could actually use all of Tuyuya's jutsu with Orochimaru instead. Same goes for Jirobo and Kimimaro, two other members of the Sound 4 that were known for having extremely good jutsu. There were a few other nutty things you could do with Orochimaru like this, but those were the main ones. You used him to do Fierce Rip, or you used him to use to you use Jutsu without having to put Dokis in your deck. Hisame came in not one, but two variants during this set, one of them being yet another starter deck card. What is with all these good starter deck cards? The starter deck variant basically made it so your opponent was constantly losing Chakra. If you go out to attack and you are opposed, your opponent loses one Chakra. If you go out to attack and you're not opposed, your opponent loses two Chakra. As good as this Kisame is, I have to say, I really don't like him as much as I like the rare that came out in the same set. Chakra Eater Sword was a huge bomb that you just blew up on your opponent's side of the field, and your opponent couldn't really predict it or do anything about it until it was too late. When he comes into play, you'd select three of your opponent's Chakra and discard them. The fact that you can select the Chakra yourself makes this an extremely devastating card because you could choose exactly the cards with the elements that your opponent would need to pull off their effects. And again, he's so unpredictable because he just drops on the field and then you immediately lose the chakra. Not like the other Kisame, where he plays and technically you can get more chakra out of your opponent with him, but you do it over the course of two, three, four more turns. The choice is up to you, of course. Their stats are pretty much exactly the same. It's just about whether you want the bigger payoff over a longer amount of time, or if you want the short nuke payoff that just happens and immediately does something to your opponent. Of course, you can't talk about water and a new set without talking about the amazing new Zabuza that comes out every set, because, of course, Zabuza and Haku are the GOATs. This Zabuza saw play for a pretty long time even after this, because his effect was basically made to destroy the metagame. If he's discarded as a result of the showdown or by your opponent's effects, meaning that if your opponent uses Kitamaru to get rid of him, for example, then you give two damage to one of the ninja that he's battled against. Meaning that if you send him out by himself to block one of your opponent's beefiest teams, especially if it's a Kitamaru team, then you basically guarantee one of their ninja's deaths along with Zabuza. The juiciest part of this is he has the effect text that this effect cannot be negated, meaning that it precedes any other effects that would normally negate his effect. This sounds like a pretty small thing, but keep in mind this steps over Shikamaru's effect, this steps over Kunoichi versus Kunoichi, it basically steps over everything that you can play after he's already hit the field. So what else do we have here? Doto? We have another... D okay, I'll, I'll take your word for it, I guess. Great Ambition. When this ninja's battling, it gets plus X plus X. X equals the number of water chakra you have in your chakra area. That's an unironically good effect. Awesome. That means if you're running a pure water deck and you can consistently keep chakra in your chakra area, perhaps by using very, very low turn cost mission cards then he can give five supports throughout pretty much the entire game. Doto loving kid, I don't know who you are, I don't know what gods you've prayed to, but Godspeed, my friend. I certainly hope you enjoyed this new Doto you got. Last Ninja Up is going to be a kind of odd choice, because it's not actually a water ninja, but it does work extremely well in water decks, Sasuke Uchiha. This Sasuke is a turn three, five, two, but cannot be sent out to battle with any Leaf Ninja. Now you could still technically put this card in a deck with other Leaf Ninja, he just has to be by himself when he goes out to battle. But this effect made him actually extremely good for Water Decks, because Water Decks have almost no Leaf Ninja that you could even include him in, considering that Water is normally where they put any of the bad guys from the show. The fact that he has 5 combat means he's really only 1 point off of many of the boss monsters that came out in water, so he was actually a pretty decent frontliner for the rest of your ninjas. We've really only got one jutsu to talk about, that being Intake of Chakra, 
Very, very simple effect. You could discard X number of your chakra to select and discard X of your opponent's chakra. Again, this was very, very controlly because if your opponent, for example, had three lightning and two fire chakra and you knew for a fact they were going to play a Rasengan or something, you could just discard all three of their lightning chakra and leave them with the two fire so that they can't respond. As great as this card is, it does come with a fairly major downside, and that being that the effect doesn't actually take place until the effect of the card comes up in the Jutsu line. What this basically means is if you declare that the number is going to be 3, for example, your opponent can actually just choose to spin that 3 chakra immediately on a Jutsu to make sure that your Jutsu actually fizzles out. It was still useful for forcing them to use their jutsu perhaps a little bit ahead of time before they're actually ready to, but I wouldn't say it was necessarily the best card out there. But with how scarce the good water cards were in the set, we're going to go ahead and include it anyway. The counter permanent broke made it so every time your opponent used an effect to draw one or more cards, you could select and discard the same number of cards from your opponent's hand so that their hand size wasn't actually going up. Now with the cards that we've seen so far, you may be asking yourself just how useful something like this could actually be, but we're going to be looking at a card in just a moment that'll show you how effective this card can be against certain deck types. Waiting for the Arrival is what I would argue probably the best water mission that came out of this set, and one of the best water missions that we've seen in a while. Its effect is you attach it to one of your opponent's ninjas, and then if that ninja is discarded for any reason while this mission is attached to them, then that ninja comes to your side of the field instead of going to the discard pile. It does come with the caveat that there are actually very effective ways of getting rid of a permanent mission card like this, and the opponent gets three turns to figure out what they're going to do about it, but it's still really good for a couple of reasons, and I'll explain why. The main one is that you have Kitomaru in a water deck, so it's very easy to pew 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 your opponent's ninja that has this attached to them down very quickly, either with a fierce rip or just with Kitomaru's effect, and then you get that ninja for free. Another thing that makes it great is until your opponent figures out what they're going to do about this card, they are normally not going to be okay with that ninja going out to battle. Battle Jutsu are some of the most powerful Jutsu in the game, so your opponent's probably not going to risk it, and that means that they probably just won't use that ninja for a few turns, making it almost a more effective caged bird. The last card we got to talk about here in water is Signs of Madness. Um, there's really not much to say about this, it was just a really really good tech card. You could take one of your tuning or higher in play ninjas and discard them in order to win one battle reward. Hypothetically speaking, if you were to put three of these in your deck, you really only need to get seven battle rewards in order to win, because you can just sort of scum out the other three using Signs of Madness. Not exactly what I'd call a perfect plan, but because the State 2 Ninja don't have ranks, this gave you an option to do something outside of just playing State 2, and actually play some of the other awesome Ninja that Water has to offer. Fire is arguably the element that was hit the hardest by the block format, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at that next. Of course, the number one thing you'd be thinking about Fire losing is free Dory decks, and there was another Chidori released, so let's go ahead and see what the damage looks like. Alright, so new Chidori. The target gets plus 5 plus 0, okay, that's pretty good. Additionally, if the target's team wins a victory or an outstanding victory, give 1 damage to one of your opponent's healthy standby ninjas. Okay... That effect is actually pretty good. It's not bad. It's suspiciously good. Where have I seen this effect before? Hey, wait a minute. Power buff? Conditional? Win victory or outstanding victory? Give one damage to one of your opponent's healthy standby. Wait a second. They just made Chidori exactly the same as Naruto's Rasengan, but it gives you two less power and has the exact same jutsu cost. Wow. Wow. Okay, I know Fire's been kind of a bully these past few sets, but really didn't have to do him this dirty, Bandai. Thematically, it doesn't even make sense. The reason that the Rasengan effect is so awesome is because that's essentially what it does in the show. You can imagine a ninja being blasted off of a Rasengan into a healthy ninja, and then that ninja getting knocked out and becoming injured. 
Chidori is a lightning blade. It blasts through the opponent. It is a lance of lightning. It pierces through the target and hits everybody in that ninja's team. I'm not saying I was Chidori's biggest fan, but thematically it made sense. It just, uh, I don't know. It's, I'm not trying to say that they should necessarily make every single card that comes out thematic in some way, but I do think it's a little bit lazy that they couldn't figure out some way to separate Chidori from Rasengan besides just giving them the exact same effect but making the Rasengan two points beefier. At the very least, make it one chakra less. What are you doing, guys? Luckily, there has been a little bit of course correction, and Kakashi's Lightning Blade is now stronger than Sasuke's Chidori's once again. We have Lightning Blade Single Slash, which just gives one damage to every single ninja battling against you. See? It's lancing through the enemy team and dealing one damage to everybody. In a straight line. This arguably makes it even better than the original Chidori, because its effect happens before the showdown itself actually happens, so it's not conditional on whether you win a victory or outstanding victory. On top of that, we also had another Lightning Blade that straight up discards one of the ninjas battling against you if your opponent has five or more battle rewards. If your opponent has four or less battle rewards, then they still take one damage, which still makes this worth the cost of two. In addition to this completely destroying of a ninja, you also get plus X plus X during the turn, X being the number of your opponent's battle rewards. By the time Kakashi is actually on the field, your opponent's likely going to have at least four battle rewards. That means that Kakashi is at the very least going to give you an extra four support for two chakra in addition to the dealing one damage. Friendship ended with Chidori. Lightning Blade is my best friend now. Okay, in addition to Chidori, we've also got to check out the new third Hokages. They obviously can't fill the boots of Bro Kage, but let's see how they did. When this third Hokage comes into play, you can give him three plus one plus one coins, and then at the beginning of each of your turns, you lose one coin unless you're willing to discard two Chakra. Honestly, this effect isn't terrible. It makes him an 8-6, so getting that six support on one of your teams is going to be extremely beneficial. I really wouldn't recommend discarding any Chakra to keep it up there, because again, two Chakra could be another Lightning Blade, and that's way better than getting this effect, obviously. But his effect is rather quaint. He's an 8-6 for a little while, and eventually he goes back down to being a 5-3, and his role after that will either be fodder or just giving three support to a team. Our other third Hokage, let's see... During the mission phase, you can discard two of your chakras to search your deck for a Monkey King Enma and put it in your hands. Then during the exchange of Jutsu, you can discard your Monkey King to give him plus five plus five for the turn. That's actually extremely good. In fact, that's so good, I would almost argue that in some cases this might be better than Bro Kage. Getting back to the idea that it's a threat that could happen, like with Kop Naruto, it's basically 5 power that can just come out of nowhere and your opponent has to plan around. Heck, using this could preemptively get rid of the power boost your opponent would normally get from a Chidori, Rasengan, or Lightning Blade. Overall, I'd say that this is a pretty great card to come out. Maybe not technically on Brokage's level, but a decent third Hokage nonetheless. Although now that I think about it, I'm trying to remember the card list, and I don't think I remember a Monkey King Enma coming out this set. In fact, now that I mention it to myself, I don't remember him coming out in quite a while. Let me go back and check and see when the last Monkey King Enma came out. Oh! That's unfortunate. Well, I, uh, hope your venue's running unlimited play. Now, before your hearts get too broken out there, there will be another Monkey King Enma coming out in just a couple of sets, so don't you worry. There was a fairly new thing being pushed in this set, uh, that being Ninja Dogs, and Ninja Dogs becoming a deck type. Ninja Dogs by themselves didn't really work, necessarily, uh, when it came to making a meta deck, but you could actually kind of build around them by using this Kakashi. When he comes into play, you can take two Ninja Dogs from your Chakra area or discard pile and put them into play, which basically gave you three deploys in one turn, which is nuts. And there were actually a couple of small ninja dogs that you could play that were actually pretty decent. 
But in addition to this, he also gets plus one, plus one for every ninja dog you have in play. So on the turn you play him, he can actually be a pretty powerful 7-4 ninja. Maybe not the absolute best Kakashi we've ever seen, but I mean, he's pretty darn good. Speaking of ninja dogs, we'll go ahead and look at one now. We have small tracker Pakun, and his effect is while you're the attacker, you can actually just move him to any one of your other teams. And if you move him to a team that's going to win a battle reward, then you can take one of your opponent's battle rewards and put it back in your hands. Unironically, this card's pretty awesome. Because if you move him to a team that normally is so weak your opponent would let it go through for a battle reward, then your opponent now has to make the choice of whether or not they're actually going to do something about Pakun's team. If your opponent lets it go through, then not only do you get the battle reward like you normally would, but you also get to take one of their battle rewards, and now you have an extra card in your hand. Is it gonna win you the game? Maybe not, but I mean, if you're summoning him for free with Kakashi's effect, I could see how this could cause a lot of problems for your opponent. The Bikochu was a client that came out that, I'll be real with you guys, I always saw it as a little bit overrated, but it was a part of the meta, so let's go ahead and talk about it. At the beginning of your turn, you can discard one of your chakras with a wind or fire symbol, and then flip a coin, and if it's heads, you can take a ninja from your discard pile and move it to the top of your deck. Again, I personally think this card is extremely overrated, but I did see it in a lot of competitive decks, so I am mentioning it here. If anything, I would want to run this in like a wind water deck, where I'm using Signs of Madness to get rid of a ninja and then put that ninja back on top of the deck, or recycle Zabuza's effect so that he dies in the showdown, kills a ninja, and then I use Bikochu to put him back on top of the deck and then drop him again. But again, that's just me. I would never run this card myself, but if you see value in it, it was a very popular card at the time. And now we get to the mission cards. Now, I know there are a couple of Fire fans out there that are probably frothing at the mouth that it's taken me this long to get to this card, but don't worry, we're here. Just like Drifting Clouds was one of the most problematic cards to come out of not only this set, but pretty much any set that would follow it for at least the next few sets. In fact, just like Drifting Clouds was so powerful, people were teching fire into their deck, not for a ninja, not for a powerful jutsu, but just so they could run three copies of Just Like Drifting Clouds. So its effect is... During the mission phase, you can take all the cards in your hand and exchange them with the same amount of cards from the top of your deck, kind of like you could with Sakura Double Personality. But then after this, you shuffle your deck and you draw one card. So no matter what, you were getting at least one card draw off of this effect. This card is actually what made Broke from Water such a decent counter card at the time, because if your opponent played just like Drifting Clouds, then you could play Broke on top of it, and then they weren't getting their one card draw, technically. They were still getting to draw the card, but then you were immediately discarding one card, so at least their hand size wasn't going up. Now, needless to say, this card is extremely good, because not only was it free card draw, but it basically lets you play whatever card you needed from your current hands, and then give you a second hands to play on, like you're playing Pokemon. That's a Pokemon TCG joke for any of you who happen to not play it. If you pair this up with Sakura Double Personality, then things got even crazier. Because just like Drifting Clouds goes off, and you get yourself a new hand of cards, plus one. Then you shuffle. Then during the Jutsu phase, uh, Sakura Double Personality's effect goes off, and you swap the cards in your hand with the cards on top of your deck, and then you don't shuffle. So it was kind of like souping up Sakura's effect, as well as giving you yet a third hand that you could play off of during a single turn. I won't front you guys, this card was extremely good. It was a hugely problematic card for the game, but there is something really neat about it. This would be a good time to tell you about something awesome that happens during the Naruto card game's lifespan. You see, if you happen to win the national tournament every year in the Naruto card game, then you were called a Sanin. And as a Sanin, you were sometimes allowed to design a card for the card game. This happens to be one of those cards. 
So the card you see before you was actually designed by one of the top players of the game at the time, which probably explains why it's so good. You get to the top, and then you design the card that'll take you to the top next year. Regardless though, there's not much else I can say about this card. Extremely good, three of in every single deck that uses fire, and probably worth running fire for if we're being completely honest. And of course, when fire gets one awesome thing, they get two. So we also have Tsunade's Guess. Basically, with Tsunade's Guess, you could either guess Ninja, or you could guess Jutsu or Mission, and then look at the top four cards of your deck. If you have at least one of the cards of the selected type, then you can put them in your hand. So for example, if you declare Ninja, then you look at the top four cards of your deck, and if at least one of them is a ninja, you can show that ninja to your opponent and then put that ninja in your hand. If you happen to have two or three ninja, then you could select one of them and that one goes to your hand. Hmm, this is quite the risky gamble card. I wonder what would have happened if they had released any cards to let you choose what the top four cards of your deck were. But I guess we'll never know. A Shadow in the Moonlight lets you reveal the top four cards of your deck, and then you could take one ninja, if there was one, and put it in your hand, and then shuffle the rest into your deck. Hmm, what an interesting card. I wonder what would happen if they gave Fire a tool that lets you control what the top four cards of your deck were. But I guess we'll never know. If we could maybe just talk about like a balanced card for a second, we have Impatience. Simply put, Injured ninjas cannot go out to battle during this turn, but your opponent does get the chance to organize their teams before you get your organization phase. This card was actually really good if you were running a Kitamaru packet in your deck, because you could use Kitamaru to injure a bunch of your opponent's ninjas, then play an Impatience that would let you swing for game during the later turns. Its real use, though, was making sure your opponent had limited options when it came to choosing a chump blocker. So if your opponent had an injured Sakura or something that they were just going to send out to block you if you sent out your real teams to attack, then you could play Impatience to make sure that that couldn't happen. Either they have to give you the battle rewards or they have to block with one of their real teams. The last card that I want to talk about is from the teacher to the pupil. Each growth coin you have on a ninja that's both Leaf and Genin, that's also in a team with a Leaf Jonin, counts as plus two plus two instead of plus one plus one. One of the main reasons I wanted to show off this card is I still to this day believe strongly in the Determination Sakura who just can continuously stack growth coins on top of herself. And it would be very easy to build a competitive deck out of that Sakura and this card. Although there's another card that we're going to be looking at here in just a second that might actually fit that bill just as well. Just keep this card in the back of your mind for right now. Growth coins being plus two plus two instead of plus one plus one. Let's mosey right on over to Earth, starting with Mental Power, of course, as that is Earth's best thing. We have Elimination. At the end of each player's turn, that player must give one damage to one of their in-play ninja with Mental Power 0 or less, if they have any. This was a pretty awesome way to punish some of the best meta decks at the time. State 2 ninja don't all have Mental Power, and Gata himself doesn't have any Mental Power. So if you were running a deck that was specifically mental power based, then you could actually drop like two or even maybe three of these in a game and have your opponent slowly kill off their own field. Important things let you discard up to two of your battle rewards, and for each battle reward you got rid of, you can give a ninja plus two mental power. It may seem a little bit insane giving up battle rewards just to give mental power to ninjas that probably already have mental power, but this was mainly great for the mirror match, where your mental power needed to be stronger than your opponent's. This may sound like a small thing, but having a Shikamaru with 6 mental power and a Sakura with 5 mental power meant that if your opponent didn't do something to counter it, you could probably step over your opponent the entire game if you're both relying on mental power. This also meant that you could give, for example, Sakura 2 mental power so she goes up to 5, and then your opponent gets an outstanding defeat every single time that Sakura wins a mental power battle on her own. Mental power battles are normally done with such small numbers that increasing a ninja's mental power by 2 or 4 is actually extremely huge. Especially considering it doesn't cost you any chakra to do so. When you think mental power decks, you probably don't necessarily think lightning, but hear me out. 
Overlapping Images is a really, really interesting card. You can choose one ninja with an entrance cost of four or less from your discard pile, and then if you don't have that ninja in play, you could take one of your current in-play ninjas and give them that ninja's name for the turn. This may sound extremely small, but there were some very silly things that you could do with this card. For example, if you happen to be running a Kakashi deck, then the turn 4 Kakashi that we were looking at earlier could actually be chosen as the target of this card. Then you could make any ninja on your side of the field Kakashi Hatake for a turn so that they could use Lightning Blade. If you combine this with a ninja who, let's say, their jutsus cannot be negated, then you actually have some really interesting shenanigans. Now, all of that sounds great, but why am I talking about it here? Well, this was also extremely good for platoon decks. So if your deck revolved around getting platoons out onto the field, then you could actually use overlapping images to cheat one of those ninjas into play so that you could play the platoon from your hand. The reason that we're looking at it here in Mental Power is because Earth Mental has two of the best platoons in the entire game. That being Shika Suma and Inoichi Ino. So if you happens to play an Earth Mental Lightning deck, then you could play overlapping images to make sure that you could cheat out those two platoons. Hypothetically, there are other platoon shenanigans you could do with this card. For example, Naruto Gamabunta, which is probably what this card was actually made for. But I do think that it's best to look at this here. That's about it for mental decks, but the Hyuga clan actually got a couple of neat upgrades in this set. First, we'll look at a brand new boss monster in Neji and Hizashi. I, looking at this card always makes me a little bit upset because the Hizashi picture that they chose to use is actually like exactly the same as the Hizashi picture they chose to use on his card, but whatever, okay, whatever. We're looking past it. They're a branch family. They don't get nice things like new artwork. So the cool thing about this card is not only is it a 7-0, not only... Is it not affected by your opponent's mission card, so they can't do any uh, shenanigans like Caged Bird? This guy here can use 8 Trigram 64 Palms and 8 Trigram Palms Rotation for free. It's kind of like a fair version of Free Dory. And while 64 Palms itself isn't a great card, you might be surprised when we take a look at Palms Rotation. 8 Trigrams Palms Rotation. It targets every ninja battling against you, and also every ninja in your team. Its first effect is any ninja in your team cannot be targeted by your opponent's jutsu cards that turn. Then you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you deal one damage to every ninja battling against you, and if it's tails, then you turn the opposing team into standby ninja. The neat thing about this is if you're using it on blocker, then your opponent's standby ninja are now all separated. So if your opponent attacked into you with a team of three ninja, and you palms rotation them to make each of them a standby ninja, then they are no longer a team of three, they are three individual ninja. This makes it a lot easier during your turn to attack into your opponent because they haven't had a chance to organize their teams back in yet. While the Hyuga clan can't really stand on their own as a competitive deck, you could very easily combine this brand new combo synergy that was given to us with Mental Power to create a pretty awesome Hyuga Mental Power deck. A new Hinata also came out. She's got growth, and every time she's sent out to battle in injured status, you give her one growth coin at the end of the turn. This is what I was talking about before. Even if you don't have Determination Sakura, you can use this Hinata to continuously gather growth coins, making the card that turns all of your growth coins into plus two plus two extremely deadly. If you just growth this Hinata one time, then she's a 2-2 in injured status. Giving two support at turn zero is actually pretty good. Then once you use her effect one time, she gives three support, which already puts her on the same tier as some turn three and four ninja. But you can keep doing it. So she can have 4 support, 5 support, 6 support, and it never really stops, especially since your opponent can also give her coins by attacking into you, giving you more chances to block. Eventually, she can have more support than some of the Kages, and if you compound that with the card that turns all of them into plus 2 plus 2 instead of plus 1 plus 1, then she can become quite the problem. 
this is going to be kind of a weird card to see here, but Naruto and Neji got themselves a pretty awesome little platoon together. It's a turn 2 five zero for 1, which is pretty cool. And it has two effects based on whether you sent Naruto or you sent Neji to the chakra area in order to put this into play. If you played this on top of a Naruto, then you can take one of your opponent's battle rewards and turn it into a chakra for yourself. That effect's fine, but Neji's effect is a little bit better. You can draw two cards immediately after platooning this on top of a Neji. Some kind of neat things to note about this card too. It has oil as its combat attribute, meaning that you can tech this into toad decks, or you can even tech toads into a Byakugan deck. And it has clone status, so this card can actually use the Rasengan. So, hypothetically speaking, if you wanted to make a Byakugan deck that also incorporates Rasengan and toads, you totally could by using this card. This set also gave us a brand new Byakugan, which really showcases exactly what the Byakugan Huga decks were meant to do now. You can discard up to X number of cards from your opponent's hand at random, which are the number of Earth cards that you have in your chakra area. They did have to put a cap of 2 on this, which is understandable because cards like this can get really out of hand, and if you happen to play two of these in one turn, you're essentially getting rid of four cards in your opponent's hand, and that could by itself win you the game already. Fire Seal exists for some reason. You look at your opponent's hand and discard one jutsu with a fire symbol. This is a very specific effect, but if you throw it in your sideboard, this could actually net you a lot of stuff because getting a chance to look at your opponent's hand for one chakra is actually fairly powerful. And if on top of that you know for a fact you're going to be getting rid of a fire jutsu, honestly, this is a pretty good card to play. Another thing that's extremely cool about it is since you get to look at your opponent's hand, if you see that they happen to have two fire jutsu in their hands, then you can actually play another one of these right afterwards to get rid of that second one as well. And then if you do all of that on top of playing Byakugan, you can basically shut a fire deck down before they even get a chance to play. While there were a few more jutsu that came out for the Hyuga clan, this is the last one that I see is really worth talking about. You can reveal cards from the top of your deck until you hit a jutsu or a mission card, or your entire deck is depleted, and then during this turn, uh, your Hinata gets plus two plus two for each card that you revealed. So no matter what, you're going to be getting plus two plus two, but you can compound that into very, very big numbers. While I wouldn't necessarily consider this a meta-viable card, I do think if you wanted to tech one of these into your deck so that you can count the number of jutsu and missions and maybe play this at the opportune time to get like a really quick plus 10 plus 10, you could totally do that. Since it doesn't say anything about clients, you could also do a very cheesy deck type where maybe you ran three of these cards and then a bunch of clients to fill out the rest of your deck and then just guaranteed Hinata becomes like a beefy plus 30 plus 30 during a turn but again that's getting into very casual territory which is not what we're here to discuss. Earth also came out with a couple of fairly decent mission cards as well. The best of which probably being Hinata in captivity. Its effect is essentially your opponent can't win any battle rewards, so you never really have to go out to block them. If your opponent wants to get rid of this effect, they have to do it by discarding two cards from their hands during the mission phase. If you play this on top of Byakugan, then you can do some really nasty stuff to your opponent, where you can basically stall them out and then just finish them off in the late game using your Neji Hizashi. And it's a pretty good time. Look for the Rare Bikochu was also something that saw some minor play. Basically every turn you got to flip two coins, and if you got heads both times, you could search for any ninja card in your deck and put it in your hands. I guess this was kind of worth it for how good its effect was, but you really weren't going to pull this off very often. This card was a bit of a Hail Mary in that you were either going to pull off its effect and give yourself a game-winning card, or you were basically just going to get two chakra out of the deal. So high reward, very little risk, definitely a viable card. And finally, we have Hive with Gigantic Larvae. At the beginning of of... of of... <sighs> of of... Great job, Bandai. Love your quality assurance team. At the beginning of of your opponent's turn, they must select and discard one of their chakras if they have any. If you drop this on turn 3, then it can punish your opponent fairly heavily in the later stages of the game, because they're going to lose 3 chakra by the time this card expires. 
So if you're playing in an area that has a lot of very jutsu-centered decks like Gara or Fierce Rip or Rasengan Chidori, then you have something that you can play against it. For whatever reason, Secret Pills was popping up in the new archetype that came out that was called Prisoner. But Prisoner cards aren't very good, so all of the Secret Pills stuff got funneled into Choji. For whatever reason, they were trying to make Mizuki a Secret Pills user like Choji so you could run a Mizuki Choji deck. Why, I will never figure out. So just assume these next couple of cards are Choji cards that just happen to work if you're running a Water Earth deck. So Orochimaru's Secret Jug. You get Secret Pills, and you get plus three plus three during the turn. But at the end of the turn, you put a minus one minus one coin on the ninja. Since most of Choji's best jutsus only activate if he has Secret Pills, you can use this to enable a Choji deck during times where you don't have Secret Pills attached, but outside of that, it's not that useful. But you also have Animalization. So this card actually requires Secret Pills as opposed to getting Secret Pills. And you get plus three, plus three during the turn. In addition, if you win a victory, it becomes an outstanding victory. And at the end of the turn, you lose the Secret Pills user that you were using this card with. So again, it's not necessarily the most viable stuff, but I still think it's really weird that they were trying to make Mizuki and Choji decks a thing. Like, why? If you did decide to do that, though, we also had Mind Destruction Jutsu if you were really into the Inoshika Cho thing. So it can only be used by a Mind Combat Attribute Ninja, most likely either Ino or Ino's dad. And you basically choose two of your opponent's ninja, and the one with the higher combat value deals one damage to the ninja with the lower combat value. Honestly, not the, not the greatest card out there, but the fact that it can be used by a turn zero ninja makes it a little bit better. If you thought Prisoner was dumb, wait until I show you bees. That's right, everybody. Bees was the other archetype that came out in the set. We'll go ahead and take a minor look at this archetype by looking at Bee Bomb Jutsu. You flip a ninja blade coin twice, and if you get heads at least once, then you give one damage to the target. So, as absolutely ridiculously dumb as this is, this is a somewhat usable card in the sense that you can choose any of your opponent's ninjas. This also steps over the Wind Jutsu Subjective because it chooses one of your opponent's ninjas and uh, that card only works with choose one ninja. So it, it hurts me to say this. It had some applications and you could technically run it. But if we're going to talk about it, we have to talk about the B ninjas too. Can't even believe that I had to say that sentence out loud. So these are the B ninja. They actually have the combat attribute B, in case you were curious. And the reason I'm showing them all to you at once is because they all have the same effect. If this ninja's team wins a battle reward, then you can take a growth coin and put it on one of your B ninja. As long as it's not the same ninja, so you can't use, for example, Suzume Bachi in a team by herself and then have her just stack a bunch of growth coins on herself. You do have to use at least two B ninja in order to make this effect work. And if you happen to combine all three of them into the same team and win a battle reward, then you essentially get three growth coins. Again, it pains me to say this, but there is a minor application in using these effects because you could pair this up into a mental power deck and have your opponent basically just lose accidentally to it. You scare your opponent off with control effects and mental power and have these guys just stack a bunch of battle rewards and a bunch of growth coins and, again, accidentally win the match through this effect. I can't. This is too painful. We gotta move on to something else. Last but certainly not least is Lightning. And even though, like I said before, Lightning was still kind of the bottom of the totem pole, they had some really, really neat stuff that I'm excited to show you. Certainly better than bees! We'll start by taking a look at what I consider probably the most interesting of the cards that were released around this archetype. 
they released a Naruto and Sasuke platoon that has clone status and oil. It also has Taijutsu, which does matter for something that we'll look at a little bit later, but we'll get to that when we get to that. This card let you run a Rasengan Chidori deck consistently. So you could run a deck that has all the Rasengans and all the Chidoris, and this could be the user of both. It costs one less to use those Jutsu, and in addition to that, it cannot be negated. Now, just to get this out of the way, yes, if you do run Shu in your deck, then you can reduce the cost of a Rasengan to one Lightning Chakra, and then use this card's effects to make that card free. Out with the Fridori and in with the Frisengan, am I right? You can't possibly understand how awesome this concept was when it came out, unless you're a Vanguard player. Imagine, if you're a Vanguard player, the moment that Royal Paladins and Shadow Paladins combined into one deck archetype. That's exactly what happened with Naruto and Sasuke. This was a fairly underrated deck type for the time, but I think you'll find that if you play around with it a little bit, especially using decks from around this era, it's surprisingly good for what it does. I'd say the only thing that held it back from being a truly meta deck is the fact that it's so predictable. Once your opponent knows that you're going to be spamming Rasengan and Chidori, then it's very easy to manipulate that, maybe mess with your chakra area so that you don't have as much chakra, or just include a bunch of stuff in your deck that negates Jutsu. I'd say it's just barely a meta deck, but not on the same level as any of the other meta decks we've already looked at so far. Of course, I can't show you something awesome like that and then not show you some actual Rasengan, so here's Blazing Rasengan. The target gets plus 8, plus 0. Ooh, Naruto, we're really moving up in the world here. And if you win a victory or an outstanding victory, then you take one of the ninjas battling against you and put it on the bottom of your opponent's deck. Honestly, not bad. Not bad at all. Unfortunately, this doesn't carry as much weight as a regular Rasengan, because it does lock itself out of a lot of great effects like Shu and the Naru Sasu platoon we just looked at, but... It's still something you could include if you've already got three Rasengan in your deck and you can't include a fourth. Jiraiya also got his own fire style flame Rasengan. Jiraiya gets plus five plus zero for the turn, and if he wins a victory or an outstanding victory, then you can discard one of the ninjas battling against you. It's interesting that this card is actually worse than the Blazing Rasengan, but I mean, I guess it worked. If you use this with Jiraiya, he becomes a 12, which I think is fairly respectable. And there's not really enough discard pile play in this game to say that returning a ninja to the bottom of the deck is necessarily that much better than discarding a ninja. While we're here looking at Jutsu, let's take a look at the new sexy Jutsu. So you have to be a dude to use it, that makes sense. And you go from being a male to female. Good, they fixed that on the older cards. They thought that it turns the opponent's male ninjas into female ninjas. But they fixed it here. You turn into a female to seduce your opponents. And the mental power of all of your opponent's male ninjas becomes zero. I've got some complicated thoughts about this card. The fact that anybody can use it and it's not a Naruto-only card makes it a fairly decent thing to include in your deck if your opponent is running something very mental power heavy, like a Shikamaru deck. But on the other hand, a lot of the really great mental power ninjas are actually female ninjas, so it's not necessarily a perfect counter to mental power decks. But this is something that you're going to notice as we look at these next few cards. They realized very, very early on that mental power was the bane of Lightning's existence, because Lightning didn't have anything that could keep up with a mental power deck. In fact, sometimes it was so bad that if your opponent dropped like a Flexamaru, you basically just had to scoop because there was literally zero things you could do against a mental power ninja like that, that you would just naturally have in your deck without needing to sideboard something in. Lightning ninjas are so bad at mental power battles, there are literally ninjas that have negative mental power that are so dumb they make the rest of your team dumber by being there. So to counteract that, Bandai actually tried giving Lightning a bunch of anti-mental power battle stuff in this new set. Sexy Jutsu is just the first one. 
We also have information analysis. Basically, if you are the attacker, uh, you get plus two mental power. And if you're the blocker, you get plus three mental power. Again, this is an attempt to try and give Lightning some mental power to fight against mental power decks and not make it a complete blowout. We have Dull-Witted Brothers, which makes every single ninja's mental power zero. And we have Exceptional Force, which doesn't do anything for your mental power, but it does make it so that if you're running one of the Fool Brothers, then that ninja's team wins a victory regardless of what the actual outcome of the showdown was. So even if your opponent comes at you with a 20 mental power team into a mental power battle, and you have negative 3 mental power fighting against them, it's still considered a victory in your favor. Speaking of the Fool Brothers, let's go ahead and take a look at them now. They are turn four seven zeros, and if you have them both in play, then they're both a nine zero instead. But if your opponent manages to play a Sanin or Satusa, which again is just Kage level ninja, then they lose three power. Now, contrary to popular belief, the two effects don't work against each other. So if you have both Fujin and Raijin both in play, then both of them go up to 9 and then go down to 6 if your opponent has a Sanin or Satusa in play. This makes them not necessarily the best thing out there, but again, having them and then having Exceptional Force is technically a counter to Mental Power decks. As a counter to not necessarily Mental Power, but basically everything else in the meta, we were also given Anko Mirarashi. If she's sent out to attack as a head ninja, then you can move one of your opponent's permanent mission cards to the chakra area. This got rid of Drifting Clouds. This got rid of Power of State 2. This got rid of a lot of stuff, and this card would continue to see meta play long after this set came out. Permanent mission cards weren't always a problem, but when they were a problem, they were a huge problem. I don't know a single Lightning player that didn't have at least one of these in their main deck. Bouncing back here to one more mission card, we have no talent whatsoever. You attach this to one of your opponent's ninja, and then if that ninja does not become the user of a Jutsu card within two turns, that ninja is discarded. Unfortunately, you couldn't do anything to cheat this card out, because it specifically says once you remove the last ninja blade coin. But because most Jutsu within the game were so obvious, for example, you knew that Fierce Rip was probably going to be played, you knew that Gata decks were probably going to have Gata using all the Jutsus, you could put this on a very powerful ninja that your opponent wasn't expecting. Something like a Kurenai, something like a third Hokage, and basically have a guaranteed way of getting rid of them once two turns have passed. Now, of course, this isn't the most powerful form of removal out there because, again, your opponent did have two turns to react to this, but it was something your opponent at least had to throw into their plans, and it could throw them off if you got rid of something like a really great back ninja that they were planning on using. Okay, the last mission card we're going to look at is information about Orochimaru. During your opponent's turn, you can look at the top three cards of your deck and then choose any number of them and put them in the chakra area. The neat thing about this is, hypothetically, if you just wanted to put all three of them in the chakra area, then you got those three cards, plus this, plus the hand cost, meaning that you just dropped five cards into your chakra area. This was one of the absolute best ways to scare your opponent out of attacking you, because it was almost guaranteed you were going to be popping off like one or two Rasengans that turn if you pulled off this move. For whatever reason, there was just a ton of Naruto platoons, and most of them were pretty good. We're going to go ahead and look at Naruto and Kiba here, because this will start us off on looking at Ninja Toads, which actually saw a lot of interesting things during this set. So when you're the attacker, you can take one of your in-play Ninja Dogs or Ninja Toads and move them into this Ninja's team. While, yes, hypothetically, there were Ninja Dogs that you could play with this, maybe throwing a Pakun into your deck wouldn't be too bad of an idea if you decided to use this card. The most interesting thing about it was, of course, that you could pair this up with Ninja Toads to make it so that you could start moving Toads into this Ninja's team during the battle phase to give you a really big beefy team. The Naruto Gamakichi Platoon gave all of the Ninja Toads in your hand minus three entrance cost, and it gave all of your in-play Ninja Toads plus one plus one power. If you were running a deck that was primarily built around the Ninja Toads, 
then this actually gave you a significant amount of power on the field. Even something as normally worthless as Gamma becomes a 3-3, and that makes it a pretty decent back ninja for your team. On top of this, sometimes this means you can get out Gamma Bunta on turn 2, which is just insane. Even better, because this card is technically Naruto, you can actually take a Naruto Gamma Bunta Platoon and put that in play three turns earlier as well. You do technically lose this card's effect, but I mean, I'd probably take having a Naruto Gamma Bunta Platoon out on turn three over just giving all of my Ninja Toads plus one plus one. If you thought that was an early time to get Gamma Bunta, just wait, okay? We've got even crazier stuff coming out. Firstly, let's take a look at just regular Gamma Kichi. During the mission phase, if you happen to get two battle rewards, you can discard those two battle rewards to put one Ninja Toad Ninja from your hand into play. Now, this card created a lot of confusion when it first came out because there is a card called Ninja Toad. But just so that we're all clear, this means a card with the Ninja Toad keywords. So Gamma Bunta still work. If you happen to get an early two battle rewards off your opponent and they're not expecting this card, it can create quite a lot of problems. But of course, it's kind of a risk and reward. Gamma Kichi on his own kind of sucks, and you're definitely not going to be taking any battle rewards with him. And if you don't get those two battle rewards really early on, then this card is essentially useless. Really, the only useful thing you can do with this is maybe turn it into the Naruto Gamakichi Platoon and then get something off of that card's effect. Toad decks essentially became Summon Gamma Bunta on turns 2 or 3 to throw off your opponent. In the older days of Naruto, this would be considered fairly broken, because Gamma Bunta's a 9-0. What am I supposed to do against a 9-0? But as the game went on and got to this point, there are actually so many good things within the game right now that your opponent getting a 9-0 on the field essentially for free was actually kind of manageable at this point. You could still step over Gamma Bunta with mental power. He was still susceptible to Fierce Rip, to all of Gata's Jutsu, and to all the effects of the Sound 5. This is something I'm actually a pretty big fan of because it gave Lightning something that in a bubble sounds really, really busted, but also wasn't so broken that it broke anything within the metagame. It just allowed lightning to coexist within it. You overwhelm your opponent with Gamma Bunta's power, as well as Naruto's Rasengan's, and you see if you can get an early win. If anything, this gave lightning a really interesting spot within the metagame, because this was really the only good early game deck that you could play that was still meta viable. Every other deck came online around turn 4, whereas this deck came online turn 2. And this is something that would stay with the Ninja Toad identity for a few sets to come. In fact, let's look at our next card, Kabuto Yakushi. Now, truth be told, Kabuto was actually just a really great card in general. It has two mental power, which is pretty good. Every turn, you can draw a card from the top of your deck and then put a card from your hand onto the bottom of your deck. It's got two support, whether it's healthy or injured. And once again, it comes from a starter deck. But the reason that we're looking at it here is because one of the things that would start to give Toads their identity is looking at the bottom cards of your deck in order to summon Gamma Bunta. I don't normally do this, but we're going to take a quick sneak peek into a card that's going to come out in the next set. The Gamma Kichi Gamma Tatsu Platoon is a card that lets you summon a Gamma Bunta if you can find one in the bottom five cards of your deck. This is something that you can check for every single turn at the beginning of your turn. So even if you don't have some kind of sneaky way to put Gamma Bunt on the bottom of your deck, this is still really, really deadly. If you happen to get an insane opening hand where you just get Gamma Kichi and Gamma Tatsu, as well as either Gamma Kichi or Gamma Tatsu, so you can platoon this on turn zero, then you can potentially have Gamma Bunta out as early as turn one. And the really cool thing about it is it doesn't actually take up your deploy for the turn. So you can get Gamma Bunta and then play another ninja on top of it. Another another cool thing about it is if you happen to play Naruto by the time you actually get that Gamma Bunta, then because of the wording of the card, you can actually get a Naruto Gamma Bunta platoon and then put that card in play. 
The reason that this is so useful alongside Kabuto Yakushi is if you happen to get to turn 2 and you haven't gotten your Gamma Bunta out in play already, you can use Kabuto's effect to put a Gamma Bunta on the bottom of your deck and then immediately get it out the next turn. So it's basically a consistency card that gives you Gamma Bunta guaranteed by turn 3. Somebody at Bondi was trying to keep Rock Lee Taijutsu decks viable and gosh darn it if they didn't kind of succeed. Rock Lee Taijutsu got a little bit of support in this set. We'll go ahead and look at his new Jutsu card, Mad Dance of Infinity. On top of being a fairly awesome name, it was on par with some of the most powerful Jutsu out at the time. Its target was just one ninja on the field, and you could reveal the top four cards of your deck and deal one damage to that ninja for every ninja that you revealed. Because decks were primarily made up of ninjas, and we had access to tools like Sakura Double Personality, it was fairly consistent to be able to pull its effect off, especially since it happened during the Jutsu phase. You see, the really nutty thing you could do with this card is you can play Mad Dance of Infinity and then activate Sakura's effect on the Jutsu stack. Sakura's effect goes off first, you stack your hand to make sure that the top cards are going to be ninja, and then you switch it with the top cards of your deck. Then you're guaranteed to pull off Lee's effect to kill a ninja. Sure, it did cost one more chakra than a card like Fierce Rip, but the fact that you didn't have to flip any coins and you could do it somewhat consistently made it slightly better and worth the extra cost. Mike Guy also had a very unique card to come out in this set. When he's defeated, completely defeated, or draws, you can put one growth coin on it. On the surface, that might not sound good at all, but consider how much healing was going around in the game at this time. If you paired up Mike Guy and something like Tsunade or Sakura, then you could actually let him get defeated and then heal him every single turn until he becomes an absolute monster. In fact, if you do this often enough, you can get him to a point where his support stat is actually pretty decent and you can actually use him as a support ninja. Guy also came with his own jutsu, Supreme Ninjutsu, one zone rule. You flip three coins and for every heads he gets plus five power. It did have the downside that if you managed to get Tails three times, then he dealt one damage to himself, but really, I wouldn't consider it that common of a problem that it actually makes this a bad card. Statistically speaking, you had a pretty good chance of giving Might Guy plus 10 plus 0 for the turn, so this was definitely worth considering. So another kind of weird thing that was introduced into this set was Taijutsu Naruto. On the surface, this card's really nothing special. Its effect is if you happen to be running him in a Taijutsu-based deck, then his healthy and injured stats are the same. So with his growth, you can actually make him a 5-1, which is very, very good for this point in the game. But that's not the main reason I want to talk about this. If you remember a little while ago, we talked about a Naruto platoon that actually has Taijutsu. And that platoon allows you to run a jutsu card that was meant for this card. That jutsu is green impact. You need a Naruto Uzumaki with the taijutsu combat attribute in order to use it. You pick one ninja battling against the user and you flip three coins. If you get heads twice, you discard the target. If you manage to get heads at least once, the Naruto also gets plus three plus zero. If this were any other element, I wouldn't consider this a great card. But the fact that this was a lightning, but the fact that this was a lightning card and lightning is all about getting chakra and reusing jutsu, this card could become kind of a problem if you're able to use it two, three, four times in a single match. And I also just love the unique interaction between this and the platoon that just so happens to give Naruto the taijutsu combat attribute on accident. That's all the elements out of the way, but I do want to talk about one more thing before we pick up our coats and get ready to leave. The reason that this set was called The Chosen is because this is the set where they started to reprint older cards so that they could stay active within the new meta. For a lot of cards, this didn't really matter too much, but for some cards, they actually got a little bit of an upgrade. For example, this Choji Akimichi actually comes from the first set of the game, and at the time, he was a 2-0 that could turn into a 3-0. So hypothetically, he was an option for Earth decks that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Naruto or Sasuke. Not the most impressive card, but also no slouch. And here, he's gotten new life, not just in the fact that he was reprinted, but he was given growth, which is something that was not available during the first set of the game. Growth actually gives him the ability to become a 4-1, 
because you can grow him into play to turn him into a 3-1, and then he gets the plus 1 when he attacks, making him a 4-1, which is pretty respectable. I wouldn't say that this current batch of reprinted cards was necessarily the greatest. None of them went on to become hyper-meta cards, but it was nice to see that Bondi was taking some steps to make sure that all of the old cards weren't going to disappear forever, and that we would be seeing some reprints of some old favorites. The third Hokage, for example, made a bit of a comeback, and now he's got three mental power to work with, which is cool. And that Haku I was talking about earlier is also here with two mental power. Again, if you don't remember the exact strategy I was talking about, basically you can use a mission card to turn this into something like, say, Kakashi Hatake. And then Haku can sit here and spam a bunch of Kakashi Jutsu, and because Jutsu cards used by this ninja cannot be negated, those Jutsu cannot be negated. But, dear viewer, I think I've held you here long enough. Set 9 was an extremely exciting time to be a member of this game, with bigger decks and more variants within the meta decks as well as the casual decks that we could play, this was a super fun time to jump in. I know that the introduction of the block format rubbed some people the wrong way, but I do hope you guys were able to look past it and still enjoy the game for what it was. The real question now is, can the next set possibly do something to follow up on how awesome this set was? No, no, the answer's no. Um, it's actually a pretty weak set compared to this one, but I mean, hey, we got a pretty awesome set now, and trust me, there are going to be even more changes in the sets to follow. You can think of set 10 as a bit of a calm before the storm. I'm not necessarily saying there's nothing cool in the next set, but I am saying that if you're watching this in a playlist and you maybe wanted to skip the next video, I would completely understand. Don't believe me? Well, I guess there's nothing to do but take a look for ourselves.